Starting us off to speak about hyperlocal interfaces, we have Rachel Law, who is the CEO of Logist and Web Designer. She previously designed uh, and coded a browser extension that allowed, allowed people to swap their metadata uh, across, uh, across networks, which essentially allows you, I believe, to, to browse the web not just privately, but as a completely different real human being. Uh, has developed a re research methodology for analyzing the size and scale of networks and successfully funded a Kickstarter. She has also exhibited interactive art all over the world uh, in Berlin, Singapore, Australia, and more and has spoken widely on networks and data. So please join me in welcoming Rachel. Uh, hello, um, can you hear me? Yeah, good. Uh, actually, I was here last year as well um, as a creative technologist. Um, and it's really interesting because within the period of last year and this year, I quit my job as a creative technologist. So maybe the end of the evolution of a creative technologist <laughs> is someone who starts their own startup. <laughs> um, so it's rather nostalgic to be back, um, especially speaking from my own startup. So let's get this working. Um, so hyperlocal interfaces. Um, the idea behind it is where do environments come from and what do we consider as environments? So here's a very brief history of environments. And I'm starting from it in terms of scale. So what do we call an environment? And this is particularly important in creative, in create tech, because the theme is environments, humans, and how we interact with them. So if we think about it, the first kind of environment that we've seen is uh, satellite orbit images from 1959, when the space, uh, NASA started their space program, they launched suborbital satellite that took satellite imagery and then it was the first time we really had this idea of a solar system. Solar? Down? Just too loud. Too loud? Here, Just put the mic down and I'll oh, turn up. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, solar system. And like because at that point before that we didn't have any idea what a solar system was and what place did Earth kind of situate itself. And in 1972, that's when we got that beautiful image of the blue marble, you know, the one that's all over the world that we all recognize as that giant blue globe everywhere. And that kind of situated us in terms of environments in solar space. And then in 1993, and that was kind of like the beginnings of like networks, and we started thinking about how uh, we zoomed it back a little back into Earth and like how devices started to talk to each other. And that created what we call it. It day, that's how it's pronounced. It's infrared data association, which is um, line of sight contact. So if I'm a device and you're a device, and if we're within one meter of each other, we can do that last jump. And then I can pass you data. And this is particularly used, this was particularly used in like hard disk drives and laptops and early mouse devices, you know, with the kind without USB, without USB cords. Um, you know, like cordless phone technology, things that were within the line of sight of each other. And then in 1998, people were like, why do we need to be next to each other in order to talk? Can we be in another room? Can we be in another space? And that's when Wi-Fi and Zigbee, um, which is a derivative of Wi-Fi, were, uh, kind of was invented. So Wi-Fi is a web, it's, a, it's not actually a web standard, even though it's now commonly associated with web standards. But what it did was it moved from suborbital to things that were in line of sight to what we know as hotspots. So things that became a hub. So the environment was now not a solar system, but a hub of activity that, was, that could be near each other, but not within the line of sight. So things that were in the same vicinity, things were in the same neighborhood. Um, Zigbee in particular used radio waves um, to create mesh networks, which you have recently was featured in the New York Times about how they've used it in the Hong Kong protests for dem democracy. Um, that's the technology that they're using, Zigbee, created in 1998. Simple way of transmitting information, communicating with each other through hubs, um, as well as our you know, everyday kind of Wi-Fi. And then like in the 2000s, and 2000s I mean like early 2000s, the web 1.0 2000, which is like 1999, 2001, up to maybe 2004, we had things like Instanon, which is the early version of Nest communications or smart devices. 
uh, low energy Bluetooth, Z Wave, and then there's a few others like RD. Um, and then, like in the future, and we're already beginning to see variations of it, like the earlier talks about wearables, um, is the idea of having a body area network or a personal network. So, instead, so from moving from a solar to a kind of hub to a kind of um, private space, and now like individual private networks where, you li where the network or environment itself is your own body. Like that's, that's kind of like a brief history of environments. And where like hyperlocals, and so like if we ask the question like what is hyperlocal and what's the difference between local, which we know it's like things that are around us, and hyperlocal, um, it, it would sit somewhere here, you know, on the time scale. Hyperlocal basically is a kind of creates a context for where your body environments would be in. So it's who you are, when you are there, and what, what you are being as. Um, okay, so this gets... Um, so if we talk about, and once we get into the idea of hyperlocal, we can start thinking of like intimate experiences that's like moving beyond the screen. So right now, a lot of us are very device-centric. There's iPhones, there's HTCs, Samsung, iPads, iPhone, uh, iPads, MacBook Pros, um, HP. You know, people associate devices with certain brands. But once we think of hyperlocal, um, we've kind of moved beyond the screen to the environment itself. It's not so much the device. It's not so device specific or device centric. We've broken away from the screen, so that the screen is just a way of conveying the information to you to a kind of intimate experience where, okay, I walk into a space and something happens, you know. Um, it all connects to, it all connects to me, it, it responds to me, it interacts with me. The environment itself is trying to talk to me and I can have a conversation with it and kind of talk back. And then when I leave the environment, it doesn't matter what devices I have, you know, that information goes away. You know, and then I move to the next environment. And that, that creates a kind of seamless, intimate experience where, it's, where, where if we think about it, it's, it's about the context of the person in a place. And I call this thing like a kind of internet of places, you know, where it's not an internet of things because things talking to each other, you know, we've done that already. Things talking to each other, like your, your phone can talk to your laptop with no issue. Why do we want things to talk to each other? We don't really want that. We want things to connect to each other, and we want places to talk to us. We want these things in these specific places to talk to us personally. As, I mean, if you think about it, do you really want your fridge to talk to your toaster? So what? But I want to be able to talk to my fridge so that it gives me a piece of toast bread at a certain hour of the day, and they'll do it themselves. But I need to issue that interaction, and that means it's an internet of places and not an internet of things. So we need to rethink how we are communicating objects, how we're communicating with our environment, and how we can create these intimate experiences that's beyond things to give a human kind of personal touch. Because at the end of the day, what's interesting and compelling is not things talking to things, it's people talking to people, but through different avenues, and how we can think about that. So in, if we're talking about an intimate experience that's context-based, um, it wouldn't just be your lap, your phone, it, it wouldn't just be your iPad. You'll be using your iPad as a kind of re universal remote control. And then you'll be shopping, maybe your granddaughter's shopping, and they'll be using their mobile phones. And seamlessly when they go back, everything loops into each other. So it becomes like a recursive kind of bubble, that's what we call it, um, where like, you know, you have information popping up in your devices, being absorbed, and then moving to other places, and a new information coming in. And what's important is you as the marker of new information rather than the things around you. So normal technology, I mean, normal, well, cutting edge, well, general technology still focuses on connecting things to each other. Um, but what would be more interesting is that if you were the connector of these devices, you know, you, you, your, your area, your near field, is the one that causes things to wake up, to communicate, to sense your presence. And that presence, in turn, creates a kind of context. And when you have context, then you have time. So William Gibson wrote this 
quote in like 1998, that the end point of human culture may well be the single moment of effectively endless duration and in infinite digital now. But then perhaps nothing is new. And in the end of our beginnings, and the bison will be there waiting for us. And this basically means, let's translate to human speak, um, that digital devices have no sense of time. They have no sense of context. And they have no sense of what we call temporal temporality. Is that how you pronounce it? Temporality? temporality. Yeah, temporality. Um, so how can we bring back temporality in like an infinite scroll? When you scroll through Tumblr, it's infinite. You don't know how much time passes because there's no bottom of the page. You are literally living in what he calls that infinite now. You know, that's why people come, you know, cases of internet addiction has gone up and you know, everything about that. So how, how do we, if we can create intimate experiences, maybe as creative technologists, designers, developers, creatives, people who are just interested in cool things, um, maybe we can bring back time, you know? Wouldn't that be cool? Like, maybe you could bring back time. You could recreate seasons. Can a web page have seasons? Can you, can you bring back a climate? Can you make an atmosphere? Um, not just like updating your web page because you have new information, but literally, if the devices can talk to each other, you know the context of the person who's in there, you know the context of like where they're at, what time of the day it is, you know, that kind of hyper-local information, then maybe you can bring back a sense of time in their life. Because you know about them, they, they voluntarily tell you this. They are passed through this place, this, this internet of places. They pass through this place, and when they move from one place to another, it's kind of like physically walking from one website to another. And within that transitional space, you could bring back a sense of time. And how would we bring back the sense of time? Can we move it like so that like, can we curate a kind of journey or user experience where the person starts from one place and then they kind of move to where it rains and then after it rains, they get like a rainbow, you know, that kind of thing. Can we kind of, can we kind of bring that kind of future possibilities to who and when you're at? And so, I think what the thing that I want to drive most is that with hyperlocal technologies, we can, in a way, create these spontaneous moments, and we can create these kind of effective experiences that kind of go beyond, you know, user experience through like making it easy and friendly. So we go through a web page. Yes, that's that's. I think that should be considered a standard, or that should be considered a norm. And like, if we want to push ourselves further, like, can we create these kind of Experiences that just make it feel like it's a progression of time that I've achieved something and I've gone through a journey with, I don't know, a brand, a story. And that's kind of like the future possibility. Like um, beyond advertising, you know, advertising has always been all about images and text. But um, with new technologies, like, okay, so we stuck iBeacons everywhere and like they've got presence in them. so. If you load the technology, if you load our app, it should give you like different experiences when you pass through each of them. Um, but what's interesting is that you could create maybe scent-based atmospheres. You could create, you could move beyond like text and images and videos into something completely different. You could create sensorial interfaces, you know, based on per the person's senses. Like it's an image, and then you walk past it, and then. There's a time to it, and then it's the end. So I have an example. So I came, I, um, I literally arrived by train yesterday night to Boston. And when you walk down Main Street, there's a chocolate factory, like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. It's on 810 Main Street. And you can smell it, but you can't eat it. You have to go to the bakery shop and buy yourself a hot chocolate and stand there in the middle of the night and smell that hot chocolate factory smell and drink your hot chocolate. And that creates an utterly different experience, you know? And what if you could do that as a designer, as a creative, as an agency? What if you could create this kind of sensory experiences that are completely intimate and special and like in the moment? 
And that could be the future of storytelling, not just telling stories through images and text, but advertising telling stories through all five senses engaged into something like completely new, and I like to say special, but like, I think it's special. Like it, it feels like it's personal and it's something for me. And so if you want to try it, um, we've, we've, you can give us uh, your email, or you can try the web service version, and, um, with, with, and you will be able to collect robot body parts to make your own robot. And when you get it, you'll get a personal robot. Everybody gets a personal robot. We actually programmed it all the way up to this morning. <laughs> um, but like, yeah. Um, so you can give it a shot and try the eye beacons, or you could just look at them and just like see how eye beacons look like and how they work. And like, we put placards next to them. And you know, because I've realized like a lot of people talk about eye beacons and low energy Bluetooth technology, and they don't really understand what it, what it looks like. And you can touch them, you can prod them. It's probably not going to fall off. Please don't steal them, because that would be sad. <laughs> but um, yeah, try it. And yeah, um, if you want, you can pass me an email, and I'll let you download our test flight version. Um, yeah, and thank you very much. Um, any questions, email me. Um, and that's our website link. And that's the end. Um, you have any questions, anybody? Well, the, um, this is an interesting question, and there are several different answers. Um, Can you repeat the question? So the question is, uh, so you're saying that the people will come to a place, and they will give you their signatures and other information, in, and, and, and they'll give their personal signature for you to track. And will people actually do that? So there's several answers to this question, and it's basically a yes, no, maybe. Yes, if depend, and that's mostly dependent on technology. So there are things like proximity, um, newer, which don't track people, but they track devices. And the, what it does is it doesn't differentiate between a device or a person. So they are tracking, but they are only, they're tracking like en masse. They don't do like that kind, they, they don't do like personalization. Then you have like really, really intrusive technologies like the Yo app, which actually, if you look at the permissions list, it's like a whole list of we have access to your camera, we have access to your Facebook, we have access to everything, and we are tracking you to death because you downloaded our app. And then there's like the in between, which is where we are, where, where we are situating ourselves at. So um, last year I built a thing called Vortex that let people swap personas and that people actually enjoy creating these imaginary personas and swapping it with each other. And what we've done is we've incorporated it so you can create different personas and you're only giving out as much information as is completely necessary. So you can decide how much information you share. And we give you full control of it. It's completely transparent. There's like a little sidebar that looks like your web browser history. You just click and unclick things and then you hit save and that creates a persona. And if you don't want us to know that you've been to this place, you just unclick it. And that's it. <laughs> and that's how we're doing it. Because we think that people want things that are relevant to them, but they don't want to give us their social security number. And I think that's perfectly fine. But um, So what we do is we do explicit permissions. Instead of implicit, which is you download our app, that means we have control of everything, we do explicit permissions. Here's a system where you can manage how much you want to show. I, I hope that answers your question.